Well, go ahead and be seated. Some of you are familiar as you're being seated with the great theologian, Mr. Bean. Anyone know Mr. Bean? He's this English comic. He's hilarious. And one of my favorite bits he does is Mr. Bean goes to church. And I felt just like Mr. Bean, because in this you will see him. He never knows when to stand. He never knows when to sit. Everyone seems to be standing whenever he's sitting. We just did, I think, an aerobics class right there. We were standing. We were sitting. We were standing. We're back. You're getting your steps in this morning. You're welcome. Last week I was not with you, uh, but it's for a very good reason. I was in Houston, Texas. Some of you know uh, my mentor was my youth pastor, my dear friend Paul Nazarian, who is a pastor at Northwoods Presbyterian Church in Houston. And last weekend they celebrated his 20th anniversary at Northwoods Presbyterian Church. It was a great occasion. I got to preach and just enjoy being with him and his family in that church. And Uh, As we were making our way to the airport, I came back on Tuesday morning. I don't know if you've been to Houston lately, but it's, it's chaos, right? The freeways are packed. There's traffic. There's accidents. Paul was telling me I would not last long because some of you know I have the spiritual gift of teaching people driving lessons while I'm driving. Maybe you've learned some of my lessons. If you've been behind me and you get too close, I love to teach you patience slow down. And Paul says, I would get shot. There's shootings all the time in Texas. So we're driving to the airport early on Tuesday morning, and there's accidents, there's traffic, and so we're, we're trying to avoid the freeways, and so we're making our way. We're both kind of get to the airport early people, when all of a sudden we look at the GPS as we're driving on these side roads, and it does that thing that maybe you've experienced where it creates a little bit of anxiety, where all of a sudden it just says, recalculating, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, you've been there with me, right? And we both looked and we're going, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And I was a little nervous because I thought maybe we're off track. Maybe it's going to send us a different direction. Maybe I'm not going the right way. And then I realized, oh no, this is a good thing, right? The GPS, it's a tool. It's a resource of alignment, It's that thing that makes sure you're on the right path to get to where you want to go. As I was watching this happen, I went, this is perfect. We are beginning this morning a series that is really connected to what Jesus says is this resource for alignment, aligning our hearts with God's heart. And that resource, that tool is prayer. Prayer is this this GPS, this recalculating resource in our spiritual lives that, that sort of help us stay on track, get back on track, find our way as we seek to, to live this life, walk this journey with Jesus. And so uh, I felt that it was a, an appropriate time to, to be reassured of how God can at times recalculate things in our spiritual lives. And so this morning we are beginning this series on the Lord's Prayer, where, where each week we are going to look at a different line from the Lord's Prayer. And, and the Lord's Prayer, how many people have memorized the Lord's Prayer? I mean, we laugh, not everybody, any, anybody. How many people are debts and debtors? Memorize, debts and debtors? Got a few? Any trespasses and those who trespass? Okay, we got some tre- Any sins and those who sin against us? You're my, yes, there we go, right? It's probably one of the first things that many people are taught to memorize. It's one of the most memorized parts of scripture. And for generations, it has been a source of wisdom, of encouragement, of depth. But you may also know that that there are times in which people don't always know the proper words to the Lord's Prayer. I've shared the story about when I was at Lafayette Orinda Presbyterian Church doing youth ministry, we were talking about this in a confirmation class, and all of a sudden one of these high school boys goes, oh my gosh, I thought it was give us this steak and daily bread. What? Or maybe you know of the person that's from Houston, Texas, who talked about Uh, They always thought, our Father who art in heaven, how did you know my name? (laughs) Not to be confused with the man from Missoula, Montana, 
who always imagined as a little boy that it was a lead a snot into temptation. <laughs> and he always thought he was praying for his, his sister, his little sister, to get in trouble. Lead a snot into temptation. I don't know why I like that one. I'm the only one that likes that one, but that's okay. Sometimes we don't always know the words right, but, but we've, we've said the prayer, we've heard the prayer, we, we understand. And many suggest that it would be more appropriately called the disciples' prayer rather than the Lord's prayer, because really it's a prayer that Jesus teaches the disciples. It's not the prayer that Jesus says he needs to pray. It's in Luke's gospel, we're going to be looking at Matthew's gospel, but in Luke, it's in response to the disciples saying, teach us how to pray. And, and this is what they're taught. In it's, it's really our prayer that God gives us. And it's a prayer that comes to us in Matthew's gospel in the midst of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And many of us are familiar with this. It's Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. It's this largest chunk of, of preaching and teaching in one place that we have from Jesus. It's, it's this enormous content that Jesus has that really clarifies who he is, what he's come to usher in. He preaches and teaches in a way that that almost turns upside down the idea of who the world, who in the world is truly blessed and and what the kingdom of God is and what the kingdom of God looks like. And and so oftentimes what we're going to find is that that kingdom doesn't look the way that people knew or the way they expected and at times even the way they hoped for. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes, uh, the blessed are's, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their faith, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, within this sermon, what we find is that the kingdom that Jesus is speaking about, the one that Jesus has come to usher in, is grounded in the understanding that some of what that God wants, some of what God hopes and expects is, is contrary to what the world oftentimes suggests. And Jesus is hoping that those who are listening, that those who hear him would pay attention to that. And, and I would suggest that We are those people that Jesus would hope would listen and would pay attention and understand what's said here. Because within this sermon, what we know is that there's a foundational commitment to to not acting with hate and judgment. The sermon really lifts up and speaks to the importance of forgiving quickly and forgiving fully, completely. It speaks about how we're really called to deal with our own sin, our own stuff, more so than, than tell people how to deal with their stuff. And the way that Jesus tells us to do this, the way that, that Jesus compels us to, to sort of take seriously and to pay attention to those foundational principles is to turn to God in prayer. Not out of a sense of obligation or because it's a chore, but just as I suggested earlier, because it's a tool, a resource for for alignment, aligning our hearts with God's heart. Prayer as this way of connecting, maintaining a conversation with God. I googled prayer this morning, and in less than half a second, I was given 1.17 billion, with a B, results. There's a lot of information out there on prayer. There's a lot of curiosity. People want to know and understand what prayer is, what prayer isn't. It's a conversation with God that yet so many of us perhaps don't always feel fully adequate at doing, sometimes by ourselves, but definitely in front of others. It's, it's been said that the quickest way for a pastor to avoid eye contact with anybody is to ask for a volunteer to pray. Would anybody like to pray? Right? We, we want to pray, but we're not quite sure we know how to pray. We're like the disciples that say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And the irony is that this prayer that we're going to look at, the Lord's Prayer, is one that Jesus gives as he's just critiqued the hypocrites that pray in public in a way that is sort of grandiose and sort of draws attention to themselves to make them look pious and faithful even though they're not. And so Jesus tells them to pray this prayer in secret, 
For your Father who is in secret will hear your prayer. And, and we have oftentimes prayed in public. But we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer as it comes to us. Matthew chapter 6. If you brought your Bible, if you have it on your phone, Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 15. We'll project most of it up here on the screens. But listen to what God has to say to us here. As Jesus says, pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your sins. This is sort of out of the NRSV translation. We're going to each week maybe look at different variations of that because there are different ways in which people have translated this prayer. But but the text itself is one that's familiar to us. And this morning we look at that first line. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And, and I've been praying that prayer for decades. And for the last number of weeks, what has been most striking to me is how the first word keeps jumping out to me. That Jesus is teaching them to pray by themselves alone in their room. And the first word of the prayer that they preach by themselves alone is our. Our Father. Jesus tells the disciples to pray in private and yet starts with our, not my. When I'm praying by myself, it's not my Father. It's our Father. And I think that's significant because it reminds us that we are all children, that God does not have any only child. Apologize to those of you who might actually be the only child in your family, but that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. God is the father of all. God is the parent of all. The word my or mine doesn't appear anywhere in this prayer. It's all about us. It's all about we even in the midst of our individual and private prayers, those times are intended to weave us into the fabric of community. The, the, the me of my prayers can never be offered unless it's integrated with the we of what it means to be a people because God is not only concerned with me. God is concerned with we, with us, with our existence. And I think this can be something that we lose in our self-absorbed, individualistic world that, that can have some unintentional consequences on our spiritual lives. We, we can allow ourselves to believe that, that God cares most about me or God cares most about the people that think and look and act most like me, which is problematic and we see the sort of sinful, divisive, toxic impact of that consequence at work in our world every day. We can forget that while we are each a child of God, to be sure, we're not the only child that God is raising. And so we maintain this commitment, as hard as it can be, as challenging as it is, to embrace this inclusive, diverse understanding of what it means to be people who can claim our Father. Because when we're honest, just like the song, the hymn we just sang, everyone can say our Father. It's a prayer for all to pray. And that, and that includes people of different perspectives. That includes people of different religious <clears throat> backgrounds or perspectives, different life experiences. That, that in humility, we really have to have an understanding that every person and their perspectives are a child of God and are a part of the hour that prays this prayer. And what Jesus also does then in this prayer is that our Father says something significant, right? That, that ultimately, at a time in which the belief, the religious belief was that God was distant and disconnected, Jesus creates this connection, this relational connection, there's different ways in which we can say this. And I want to say just a bit about language, right? That there's no doubt that Jesus said, Abba, our Father. But Jesus didn't say Father out of a sense of lifting up maleness. We can say our mother. We can say our parent. 
We can say our creator because what Jesus is speaking of is a relational quality, not a biological one. And so many are threatened as we try to expand language to, to capture a, a, a fuller understanding of who God is and what God is doing and what Scripture says to us. And, and when we look at this, there's a, there's a parental quality that Jesus is lifting up about God that, that not disconnect, not disengaged, but instead invested in, loving, caring, concerned with, as a parent is concerned with their child, that's how God relates to us. It's a relational affirmation that, that the hour that we speak is about a, a relational connection that God desires to have with each one of us. And within that first line, what we then realize is that, that there's something of the limitation of what they knew and something of the affirmation of what they wanted to say. That God being in heaven, we, we should at least pause and recognize that this three-tiered understanding of the universe was what they, what they had, right? That heaven was above, the world was in the middle, and Hades and bad stuff was down below. We know that's not how the universe is anymore. The church seemed to be the last institution to, in the sixth century, I think, let go of this three-tiered understanding of the universe, maybe the 16th century. Do you know what it was? 16th century, let's say. That that's not the way the universe works, but ultimately what the prayer is trying to say is that, is that God is not contained to this world. That God is in heaven, that God is, is in and beyond this world that we're living. And that God's name is hallowed, is holy, is sacred and set apart. That there's something distinct and unique about who God is and how God relates to us. And so I think this first line really sets in motion a pretty profoundly true insight as to who God is, who we are, and how we are to relate to this creator of the universe, this creator of each one of us that is engaged with us, cares for us like a parent cares for their child. And so this next several weeks, I want to invite you to take on a spiritual practice with me. I know it's not Lent, and so you might not be really open to spiritual practices. Normally in Lent, that's when we do that. But I want to encourage you to take on a spiritual practice that, that will allow this prayer to be a part of your daily life. In the Muslim faith, they have what's called the salat, which is praying this particular prayer five times a day. We may have friends that do this, that face Mecca and, and pray five times a day. We're going to do salat light because we're not going to pray that prayer three times a day. I want to encourage you to think about praying the Lord's Prayer. Setting in your calendar or, or wherever you can with intentionality do this, in the morning when you wake up, during the day around midday, and in the evening before you go to bed, praying the Lord's Prayer, reciting the Lord's Prayer, not because you're trying to master it, but because you want to really marinate in it. That the words would just become a part of of your conscious and your subconscious way of thinking and being and living, that you would allow it to seep into your heart, your mind, and your spirit, that, that perhaps saying this prayer several times throughout the day would allow it to become a tool, a resource maybe even of realignment, of aligning our hearts with God's heart. Because I believe that these next several weeks are going to be an invitation for us to take on that practice in a way that that allows this prayer to add meaning and energy and encouragement in our lives. That, that as we do so, as, as I do so, as you do so, as we do so, that something will happen and that change can take place. And that won't just be a prayer that we say, but it might be able to be a prayer that we live by as well. You know, that, that idea of practices is something that the church has always done. Worship in many ways is a spiritual practice. It's coming together with intentionality to, to be reminded of things. I hope you'll consider praying that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, three times a day as a, as a reminder of things. We gather around a table because it's a reminder of something. We don't, we don't, all of a sudden right now wonder if we're okay and as soon as we eat this meal, then we'll, be rem then we'll be okay with God. The sacraments are a visible reminder, a visible practice of an invisible truth. And we gather around this table, we share this meal because we want to be reminded of the invisible reality of God's love for each one of us. That, that for all that is different about us and there is a lot that is different about us, 
What we have in common is that, that this creator of the universe, this parent of each one of us, has love for us, has love for you, has love for me, has love for we. And this meal speaks of that love. And those who want to, who find their identity in that love, not because we've got everything figured out, but because we believe that there's something right in that love, are invited to share this meal so that we might be not just recipients of grace, but extensions of it at work in our lives, with our families, at school, at work, in our neighborhoods, in our community. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for this chance to come together, to be uh, united in your love. And we do pray, God, that you would open us to your spirit. We thank you for uh, the ways in which Jesus taught and for the prayers that can sustain us as we seek to journey with you. We ask, God, that your spirit would fill us, fill this place, that this bread, this juice, these elements that we use if we're online, whatever they are, that, that we would not be preoccupied with what they are, but what they speak of, a grace and a love that, that you extend to each one of us. Help us to, to marinate in that love and to be liberated by that grace. We pray that your spirit would unite us, that it would equip us as we share this meal together. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. And as he was gathered together with them, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he blessed the bread and he broke it. And he turned to them and he said, take and eat all of you. This is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after supper in the same way, Jesus took the cup. And after having poured the cup, he explained to them that this cup is the cup of the new covenant. A covenant which is a sacred promise between God and God's people. It's sealed in Christ's blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this, Jesus says, in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread, every time we drink from this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for each and every one of us, the people of God. I'm going to invite you uh, in just a moment. We're going to have some folks from our church that are going to come forward to help us kind of just have stations up here. As you're able... Uh, if you would come down the center aisle, if you're in these two sections to come to a station, there's going to be bread. You can take a pre-cut piece or you can tear off a piece or you can have a gluten-free cracker, whatever it is. There's juice then in the cups to take bread, to take juice, to eat, to drink, and then to head back to your seat down these outside aisles. There's baskets that you can put the glasses in on your way back. Those of you who are in the side, you'll want to walk towards the front of the sanctuary and there'll be people up here who will be doing the same thing, offering bread and juice. The balcony, you'll have your own folks that will come to you. If you're not able to, to make it down, just stay where you are and we have folks that will walk around and will bring those to you. And if you're wanting them to bring the elements to you, they'll do so. But let's gather. Let's share a meal that speaks of grace, that reminds us of love and unites us in that reality. Amen.